Open your copy of the Word of God, please, to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20. And I want us to look at a few verses there together. I hope that you'll be able to be here tonight. We'll be celebrating the ordinance of baptism, but also I'm going to bring the little miracle lady with me tonight. And Miss Glenda's going to be here. She's going to try to be here tonight. You pray for her today, and she's starting to get out and about, and... Uh, so she wants to come tonight. I hope that you'll be able to be here to greet her and welcome her back to the services. I, uh, I was relieved this morning that the special music wasn't a Christmas song because, quite frankly, the message this morning isn't a Christmas message. As a matter of fact, this is a very serious message this morning. It's a very serious and sobering message. It has to do with the final judgment. You see, friends, when we think about the coming of Jesus, remember this, Jesus didn't come that we might have a holiday. He came that we might be holy. He didn't come that we might have a few days of vacation he came that we might have eternal salvation. And so the coming of Jesus, that first coming of Jesus, He's coming again, but that first coming, we need to understand it wasn't for the purpose of jingle bells, it was to save souls from hell. And there's a day of judgment that's coming. As a matter of fact, everyone is going to be judged for the believer, listen, for the believer, we have already had some judgment and judgment is going on and a judgment awaits the believer. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, listen, friend, listen, judgment has already taken place for your sins if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that judgment took place nearly 2,000 years ago and it took place on a hill called Calvary where Jesus died on the cross and God wrote in red, I love you, just like we heard a moment ago. And so judgment for our sins has already taken place. Now there's a judgment of sons that goes on daily. And that is to say that God judges, he corrects his children day by day. Isn't that what the Bible says? Every son that he receives, he scourges. That means that God corrects us and there's a, a daily judgment, a judgment of sons. And then there's a day that my friend, listen, my born again believer, friend, that, that there'll be a judgment of our stewardship. Our stewardship, the things that we've done for the Lord and the purposes for which we have done it. We'll stand before the Bema seat judgment of Jesus Christ and there our stewardship will be judged. But this is not the, the judgment of believers that we're looking at this morning. This is the judgment of the damned. This is the judgment of the lost. This is that final day of judgment. And it's a very serious subject that we look at today. Would you stand with me as we begin to read from the Word of God? And in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11 and following, it says this, and I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books, plural, the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, friend, I want you to listen this morning like you've never listened before. And as we move into this message, I don't, I don't want anyone passing notes. I don't want anybody giggling. 
whispering. I want everybody to have their mind riveted on this passage of Scripture. And as I was preparing for this message, I asked the Lord, Father, if there's any way that I've missed it somehow, please let me know. I don't want to stand before this great white throne judgment. And that's been my prayer for everyone that hears this message today. And let's pray now. Our Father and our God, we come to this most sacred moment. We thank you for the way your Spirit is already poured out upon this gathering and the one preceding this. We thank you for Alan coming to Jesus today. And Father, we just pray that no one would leave the premises, no one would leave this room today uncertain about their salvation. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who has a hope so, think so, maybe so salvation, when they go away, they'd have a no-so salvation. Those that are lost, Father, by your Spirit, convict them that they might know that they can be saved and saved today. That's our prayer in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Would you be seated, please? I want you to see, first of all, the scene that's described here. And notice it says that, that John saw a great white throne. Now some people, when they pray, they, they are not knowledgeable about this scene. And they pray sometimes, Lord, may we all or may I stand before your great white throne one day. Don't ever pray that for me. I do not want to stand before this great white throne because those that stand before this great white throne are those that are condemned to hell. So don't pray that way. Don't pray that you'll stand before this. See, it's called the great white throne. Great because of the power. It's white because of the purity. And it's a throne because of the purpose. It's set there to judge those that will receive the second death, the lake of fire. It's an awesome thing. It's an awful thing to see. But there's an awesome person that's sitting on this throne. Look with me. It says not only that he saw a great white throne, but him who sat upon it. Who is this that's sitting upon this throne? Who is it that is worthy, that's, that's able, capable of sitting on that throne and judging those that will come before that judgment. Well, friend, that person who sits on that throne is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It is not even God the Father, it is Jesus. And you can jot this down in your notes. It says in John 5, verse 22, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. This is the Lord Jesus that sits upon that great white throne judgment. And the one that came and was judged by the world not to be fit to live will sit in judgment upon that world. My friend, listen, you may take the name of Jesus lightly today. And there are those that use the name of Jesus so lightly. And they say, say it as if uh, it were a cuss word. Jesus Christ, you hear people. And it's creeping into the media more and more. You hear more people on the television and the movies saying, Jesus, or Jesus, which is just short for Jesus. My friend, listen, you may take that name lightly today. You will not take that name lightly on the day that we're looking at. He sits on that throne, that great white throne of judgment to judge those that are to be condemned to the lake of fire. Oh man, listen, it's an awful place. It's an awesome person on that throne. Not only that, I want you to see the awkward position all those that will be in when they appear before that great white throne. Look at what it says. It says there that the presence, from whose presence the earth and the heaven fled away and no place was found for them. That means, friend, listen, there's no place to hide. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what did they do? They went and hid, didn't they? They found bushes and trees to hide behind. God still found them, but they hid. But on that day, there'll be no earth, there'll be no heaven. You can't hide anywhere from this judgment. If you're to stand before this great white throne, you will stand there. You'll stand there before that throne. You'll not find a place to hide. There's an old spiritual that used to sound uh, say something like this. I went to the rock to hide my face. 
But the rock cried out, no hiding place. And friend, on the day of this great white throne judgment, there will be no hiding place for those that stand before that, that great white throne. Oh, what a scene. What a scene's described here for us. But not only that, I want you to notice with me the summons that's delivered in verse 12. It says, And I saw the great and the small standing before the throne. The great and the small. You see, my friend, on that day, it won't matter if someone has a Ph.D. or a GED. It won't matter. It won't matter whether you died a millionaire or you died a pauper on that day. The great and the small are going to all be there. It's not going to matter if you were the president of the United States or you pushed a broom for a living. The great and the small, they'll all be there. Who's going to be there? Well, first of all, we know there's going to be the out and out sinner there. Now, that's clear for, to anyone. The out and out sinner, the one who, who shakes his fist in the face of God and says, I will not follow you. The atheist, the one that denies God, the one that, that you and I see on our television set sometimes that, that participate in all kinds of lewd behavior and lewd attacks upon the church and upon the, the, uh, the Word of God. Listen, those are the ones that hate God, that hate His Word, that hate His church, that hate His people. The out and out sinner will be there surely. My well, friend, that's not the only kind of people that's going to be there. Yeah, the out-and-out sinner will be there. But friend, listen, there's going to be some good old boys standing there too. There's going to be some good gals, some fine gals. There's going to be some real ladies that are going to be standing before that throne. My friend, there are going to be those that are good citizens. There are going to be those that were good neighbors. There are going to be those there that were good husbands and good wives and good people and moral people that tried to live a good life. But friend, they will be there. They will be there before that great white throne judgment. The people that you say, well, those people are such nice people. Did you, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, there was a movie on TV. I got home on Sunday night and, and turned the TV on and there was a movie on called Ghost. Now, uh, I, I have a personal conviction. I do not go to see R-rated movies. I, just, I don't care who's in it. I don't care how appealing it looks. I don't care if it's a Clint Eastwood shoot 'em up I don't care what it is. I don't go to R-rated movies. It's a personal conviction of mine. So I have to wait for them to come on TV so I can see them. <laughs> but <laughs> I got home. <laughs> That's when they cut all of that, or most of that garbage out of it. It didn't need to be there in the first place. And so I watched Ghost. And, and, and in that movie, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but in that movie, when the bad guys get it, when they, when they die, they come out of their bodies, and then these black spirits come. And they're not out of their bodies, but just a little while, and these, these awful, uh, scary black uh, spirits come and grab them and take them off, take them away. Man, that ought to make somebody think. <laughs> that ought to make somebody think. Amen? <laughs> and then when the, the main character dies, or when, when his spirit finally, finally does what it's supposed to do, well, then a bright light comes on him, and all things wonderful, all little sparkly things come around him, and, and he's, of course, taken off to the good place. <laughs> but you know what? There's not one mention of Jesus in that movie. And friend, listen, he might have been a good guy in that movie, but I want to tell you something. Good guys go to hell without Jesus. That's right. You may be a good father. You may be a good wife, a good mother, a good father, a good, a good person, a good neighbor, but if you don't have Jesus, my friend, listen, you'll stand before this great white throne one day. You've got a date with destiny. Not only with destiny, you've got a date with deity. You've got a date with Jesus one day. And you'll either meet him here as Lord or you'll meet him there as judge. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. I'm not saying these things to be mean. I'm saying these things to be kind this morning. And there are people perhaps even in this room that are good people, moral people, people you like to be around that don't know Jesus. 
And if you don't know Jesus, you're lost. There'll be another kind of folk there too. There'll be those, those sorrowful sinners. There'll be those there that, that will stand before that great white throne judgment and will say, they'll be the ones that knew they were sinners, that knew they needed to be saved. But they just kept putting it off. You see, Satan's trick is not to deny the word, it's to get you to delay your decision. That's right, get you to delay your, your decision. Well, there's always time. And we look at different stages of life. We see that cuddly child and we say, oh, that little child, he's too young. He hadn't reached the age of, of accountability and we ought not to, to talk to him about heaven and hell and those things like that. Well, friend, listen, any time God begins to work with a child's heart, we ought to be very sensitive. And we ought not, not ever, ever, ever put a stumbling block in the place of a child who's taken a step toward God. Now, we want to be sure that it's the real thing, don't we? There's enough of us here that walked down an aisle as a child and then got saved as an adult. And so we want to be sure that when that child takes that step toward God, there's a clarity, there's an understanding, there's real reality to what's going on. And then there comes those uh, tumultuous teens, those teenage years. And oh, there's so much going on and there's sports to get involved in and there's things at school and there's activities and there's this and there's that and all kinds of things and pleasures to get out and enjoy and we think well teenage years that's not a time to receive the Lord I don't want to become a Christian when I'm a teenager and miss out on all the fun <laughs> it's funny how we look at things isn't it and then there's those tremendous 20s when we get out of school amen <laughs> We get out of school, it's all behind us, and we face life, and we begin to, to find our life partner, and we, we settle down, and we buy a house, and we start having a few little kids around the place. And, and those, those days we say, well, I've just so much going on, I just don't have time for God now. And then there's those tiresome 30s when you realize all the stuff you bought when you were in your 20s, you've got to pay for it now. <laughs> And those kids are not the cute little things in the bassinet they used to be. And you say, well, I just don't have time. And I, I want to spend time doing this with my family and go here and go there. And, and uh, we don't get serious about the Lord. And then the 40s come along, those, those feverish 40s. Those kids are now teenagers. And man, you got all you can handle. <laughs> those kids are teens and they're driving you crazy. And you think, oh, I've got to get these kids through through their teenage years, and then maybe I'll think about the things of the Lord. And then the, the uh, I could say the flaky 50s, that's where I am. <laughs> the flaky 50s, you know, so many people, that's when they change partners, that's when they change their occupations, they get in their 50s, and that, that middle-aged crisis hits you. You know, I've got to get through this, and that. I, I don't think God's got any place in that. That time of life. And then the sinking 60s and you begin to slow down and things are just not the way they used to be and you, 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 you can do, can't keep up when you want to and all that kind of good stuff. And you sit in a rocking chair and can't get it started and things like that start happening to you. <laughs> and then come along those uh, sinking 70s or those uh, solemn 70s and you realize the Bible says that that it's, a man has three score and ten years, that's 70 years. If you're past 70, friend, you're living on borrowed time, aren't you? You're just being especially blessed by the Lord. And then those aching 80s come along, and then those nodding 90s, and then it's all over. And somehow God never found His way, or we never allowed God into our lives. Friend, listen, you know, it's, it, it is a true, it's a statistical fact. If you don't get saved when you're young, you probably won't get saved when you're old. Friend, listen, the revival's not going on in the nursing home. Why is it? You think those people, they know they've only got a limited time. They, they ought to get right with God, yes, but they said no so often that their heart is hard, hard, hard. And every time you say no to God, your heart gets harder. Don't you ever expect, don't boast yourself of tomorrow, friend. And if you feel the tugging of the Lord in your heart, 
during this message this morning, don't you dare say no because he may never deal with you like that again. Your heart may be too hard. There will be those that will stand before that judgment that say, well, I meant to get saved, but somehow I just never came around. And then there will be another group at that great white throne, and this is probably the saddest group of all, and that's the church member. The church member. The religious person. The religious crowd. Preacher, what do you mean by that? I mean those that week after week sit in the services, they serve in the church, they tithe, they give, they go, they do all the right things, but they've never really had a personal experience with Jesus. And so many of them, so many, so many church people are going to stand before that great white throne judgment and wonder, how in the world did I end up here? But remember, Jesus said there will be those that will come in that day and they'll say, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name and do this in your name and do this in your name? And I'll say, depart from me, you what? Workers of iniquity, for I never, what? I never knew you. Friend, listen, you can know the plan and not know the man and miss it all and go to hell. And I think sometimes a church member is the hardest person to reach because that church member says, The devil says in that church member's mind, what will people think if I walk down an aisle and receive Jesus? What will they think? I've been a member here for all these years. I've I've taught Sunday school. I've done this and I've done that. Friend, listen, who cares what people think? It's what God knows and what you know that matters. So don't miss heaven. Don't go to the place of eternal fire because you don't want to be embarrassed. There's going to be a great, great crowd at that great white throne judgment. The in and the out and outs, the in and outs, the down and outs. Oh man, I don't want to be there. I, I, I prayed God, God, if there's any way I've missed it, please let me know. I don't want to go to this great white throne. I don't want to go there. And I don't want you to go there. Now we've talked about the people that are called to that. Now what about the places from which they are called? Look at what the word says. It says that uh, the sea gave up the dead that was in it and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. Now what does that mean? Friend, that means that, that there's a day coming even for the lost person when there's going to be a resurrection. When the spirit of that person, when the spirit of that lost person and the body of that lost person come back and there's a resurrection. You say, well, how can that be? There's people that have died thousands of years ago and they're, they've turned to dust. God knows where that dust is. <laughs> God knows everything. He's, he knows where that dust is and it may seem fantastic to us, but it's just, it's just something God can do without even any sweat. And bringing that body and that spirit back together to stand before the great white throne judgment. Friend, listen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> there's a, a scripture over in the a book of Acts that speaks about resurrection. Let me just turn over there and you can jot this down and, and look at it later. But in Acts, in Acts uh, 17... In Acts 17, in Acts 17, it says this in verse 31, the last, towards the end there, yeah. Because he has, that's God, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, that's Jesus, whom he has appointed, having finished proof to all men, furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Jesus was resurrected from the dead and we will be too. Some will be resurrected, some will be caught up in the rapture, some will be taken in that way and others will be resurrected for the great white throne judgment. And that spirit that has been in torment will be reunited with that body that's been in the grave and that's the places from which it doesn't matter where you die, it doesn't matter. Died at sea, bury at sea, the sea is going to give up its dead. The earth will give up its dead. The grave will give up those bodies and they'll stand before God. 
This is an awful thing that we're talking about today. It's an awesome thing. It's, it's terrible when we think about just what's going to take place there at that great white throne judgment. Now let's think about something else together. And that is as this judgment goes forward, I want you to understand the secrets that are going to be disclosed. The secrets. You see, those things that, has been, that have been done in private... Those things that were done in the dark, they're going to all come to light. They're going to all come out. They're going to all be shown. As a matter of fact, let me just read some scriptures that I've copied down here. You just put these in the margin or on your notepad and look these up for yourself. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Romans 2, 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4, 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Jesus said in Luke 12, 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Friend, listen, those secret things, even those secret things. Now, there are things that we do in public that's enough to condemn us. But not only the things that we've done in public, but the things that we've done in private are going to be revealed. You hear what I'm saying? When uh, we were back there in the hospital and and Glenda's, uh, we had a lot of visitors. Oh, we just had a flood of our family coming by. And, and Glenda's folks had come. And, and I remember one night her, her mother came and some of the kids were there. And it's, the room was filled. And those, uh, my, my wife's brothers and sisters began to, to tell about things they did that her, her mother never knew about. You know? And they, they, we did this. And, 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 and Margaret would say, well, I never knew that. <laughs> Friend, listen, you might have hidden it from mama, but you didn't hide it from God. Your wife may not know about it. Your husband may not know. Your mother, your dad, but God knows. And on that day, it's going to be shown. It's just as if your guardian angel has been walking around with a camcorder. <laughs> you know, with a little red light beeping all the time. And everything you've done, everything in the light, everything you've done in the dark, everything wherever you were, whenever you were, however it was, and that recorder's going. We're recording this message right now. People will listen to this tape. Long time. Some of these tapes go to Central America. Some go to, to India. People will listen to these tapes. But listen, this is nothing compared with God's tape. Man, He's got that thing going all the time. He's making a record. It says here that there are books there, and those things that are done in public, those things that are done in private, they're going to be revealed on that day. I remember Fred Lowry saying in a message one time, he said he was praying to the Lord, he said, Lord, people are telling lies about me all over town. They're telling lies. And God said back to him, you ought to be glad they're not telling the truth about you. Oh, listen, you can tell the truth about me and I'm in a heap of trouble. <laughs> what do you mean, amen? <laughs> he knows the truth about me. So <laughs> well, folks, listen, uh, it's going to all be revealed on that day. Not anything hidden. Not anything. And those things you did while you were away from home, they're going to be revealed. They're going to be revealed. Those secrets are going to be disclosed. And we just need to understand that everything, even those, you know what the Bible says? Even our idle words will be judged. Isn't that what it says? People say, oh God. They're going to stand before God for that one day. They're going to say, well, I didn't mean anything by it. People say, oh Jesus Christ. Listen, friend, you're going to stand before God for that one day. So, well, I didn't mean anything by it. That's what's so horrible about it. You didn't even mean anything by it. You took the name that's above every name and used it in an idle, vain way. 
Oh, what a day that's going to be. Now something else, we're just about finished here, so hold on now. The sentence declared, look with me, in the latter part of verse 13, it says, they were judged, how many of them were judged? Every one. Every one of them, according to their deeds. This is a sure thing. It's a sure thing. It says every one, every one, it's sure. And not only that, it is severe, according to their deeds. Now what does that mean? According to, the, that means my friend, on that day, on that day there's no, going to be no mercy, there's going to be no grace. You understand that? You say, well I thought God was a God of mercy. He is. You say, well I thought God was a God of grace and love. He is. But friend, on that day, it's going to be judgment. Folks, I don't want judgment. I want mercy and I want grace. Listen to some scriptures that have to do with it. Don't boast yourself of tomorrow. You don't know if you're going to live tomorrow. Or not. If you want love and mercy and grace, it's today. It's today. It won't be then. Scripture says this, I have heard thee in a time accepted, that's this time, that's today, in the day of salvation have I succored thee, behold now is the accepted time, behold now is the day of salvation. So my friend, listen, it's got to be today. That day, there will be no mercy, there will be no grace. That day is going to be a, the day of judgment. If you want to experience, if you want to experience God's love and mercy and grace, it needs to be today. In every courtroom, every trial, listen, there's evidence that's presented, there's a defense that's offered, and then there is a sentence that is pronounced. And it'll be that way then. On that day, there'll be the evidence presented, all those things that we've talked about, those secret things, those public things, those private things, all of it's going to be that big mountain of sin. And then the chance to offer a defense, and there will be no defense. You will have no real defense. The best thing that will be probably offered on that day will be excuses. But that won't work either. You see, there may be some that will say, Well, Lord, don't cast me into hell. I was just confused. There were so many different denominations, so many different churches, and I, I just didn't know whether it be a Baptist or a Methodist or a Pentecost. I didn't know. And God will say, I didn't tell you to trust in a denomination. I said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Someone might say, but God, I knew hypocrites in the church. Well, I knew some people right down there in Temple Baptist Church that, that were church members and claimed to be saved and I lived a better life than they did. They were hypocrites. And God will say, I didn't tell you to believe in the hypocrites. I said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, God, don't cast me into hell. There was that little red-headed preacher down there. And I just, I did not like him. He was good looking, but I did not like him. Hey. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> you know what God's going to say? I didn't tell you to believe in that preacher. I said, believe in the Lord Jesus. And there'll be no defense. And the sentence will be pronounced. And what is that sentence? It says very clearly here that those whose names were not found written in the Lamb's book of life were thrown into the lake of fire. That is hell. The lake of fire. That's the second death. That is hell. Then I want you to listen to another scripture. In Hebrews chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 28, it says, Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Listen to this. 
How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? In verse 31 it says, It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Folks, if you... It doesn't matter about the heathen in Africa right now. What matters is about you. And after attending here, after hearing this message, if you go to hell, you will have trampled underfoot the Son of God. Believer, our sins have already been judged. The Plains Indians used to be subject to all kinds of hazards. And one of the hazards that they would have to undergo from time to time was prairie fires. And prairie fires happen frequently in nature. And flash of lightning, just some kind of a natural condition, and a prairie fire springs up just like that. And the, the, the uh, grass on the prairie just blazes and runs through the prairie and devours everything in its path. How did those Indians, how did they survive that? When they would see the smoke and realize that a prairie fire was coming, they'd get outside their camp and they'd burn the grass around their camp. They'd burn a big circle around their camp. Why would they do that? Because, friend, where the fire has been, it will not come again. How can you stand before that job? You, you can't stand. Only way you can stand is to settle out of court. <laughs> and you can do that today. You can do it right here. Just like Alan did this morning. You can do that right now. You can do it by receiving Jesus now as Lord instead of facing Him one day as judge. Would you stand please? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Would you bow your head? Everyone, every eye closed, everyone. I'm going to close my eyes because I'm going to ask you a very personal question. If you're sure, without any, without any doubt, without any doubt at all, if you're sure that you're saved, would you just raise your hand and hold it up for a moment and then put it back down? Thank you, thank you, thank you. No one looked. That was between you and the Lord. I didn't look myself. And I ask that question to cause you to really have to come to grips with this thing. I ask that question so that you'd really have to face the issue. And friend, listen, and I say friend, friend, listen, if you were not able to raise your hand, I want to ask you if you would pray a prayer to receive Jesus right now. Right there where you are, if you could not raise your hand and you want to be sure that you're saved, that you'll not go before that great white throne judgment, you'll not be cast into the lake of fire, I'm going to pray a, a prayer. It's a simple little prayer. And I want you in your heart to pray this prayer with me. I'll say a phrase and then you just follow along. You say it in your heart. You don't have to say it out loud. God knows our hearts. And we can pray silently as well as we can pray aloud. And you follow along with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I don't want to go before that great white throne. Lord, I want to receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. And the best I know, based on what you've said, I open the door to my life and I receive you, Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. In your name I pray. Amen. Now heads bowed.